he, a guy named James, he had built a, an interesting service called a street near you, which, um, which was, he had taken a data set. He came from the background of working in uh, museums and they found a data set of the addresses and photos of people who had died in World War One. So kind of millions of people in the UK who had millions of soldiers who have died. And he took that data set and he, all he did was, um, you know, it's on index cards, physical index cards, and they digitized it and geocoded all the addresses and then it created literally a mashup, as you say, like, like showing that on a Google map. Welcome to another episode of the Map Scaping Podcast. My name is Daniel and this is a podcast for the geospatial community. So today on the show, I'm lucky enough to be talking to one of the founding members of a community called Geomob. So without giving too much away, I can say that Geomob is a, it's a community of people that are very broadly interested in, in geospatial. But before we get into the interview, I would like to take a few seconds here just to thank the sponsors of this podcast. This podcast is sponsored by a company called HiveMapper, and, and this is a company that lets you upload video footage to their platform, and they automatically convert it into 3D geospatial data. So if you're a regular listener of this podcast, you will have heard me say that a few times before. But what I haven't said before is, thanks to their support, we are reaching thousands of people and we're spreading the word about geospatial and for that I am truly grateful. Okay, here is the interview. Hey Ed, welcome back to the podcast and I say welcome back because you've, you've been here before. The first time you came along you talked a little bit about geocoding and translating between machines and humans and I remember when you when you contacted me and said hey I'd like to talk about this and I think it would make an interesting topic. I remember thinking okay geocoding I, I think we all get what it is but it very quickly became very obvious to me that you are someone who thinks very deeply about the geospatial industry and, and I really enjoyed that conversation. And because I've talked to you before, I'd like to, this is going to be my first attempt at, at actually introducing someone. So for the audience, to give you a little bit of background, Ed runs a, uh, an open, open cage data, which is a geocoding coding service. He's also invested in a few different geo startups. And he is, I guess you could call you, call you the founder of something called Geomob. It's a really interesting movement and, I th and, and you're creating a really interesting community. So I'd like to try and tell the listeners what's happening with Geomob. What is it? How do you, how do you get involved? And then perhaps try and draw, draw some parallels to what's happening in the wider geospatial community. So welcome again, Ed. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me back. Uh, Geomob, so first of all, it's not entirely correct. I was not the founder of Geomob, but um, had been running it for about 10 years. So the original founder was a guy named Chris Osborne, and then he uh, he moved and he wasn't able to keep running it. So then, then we took it over. Um, Geomob is a meetup that we have uh, every couple of months, so usually about once a quarter. Um, and we started it in London, and we've been running it in London for about 10 years. Um, and, and since then, we've now expanded to a few other cities. We're now in four cities and hopefully growing to a few more. Um, the, the thing that's different about this meetup is it's not a technical meetup. It's not a, um, it's not a startup event. It's not a pitch event or anything like that. Um, the, the only purpose of Geomop is to bring together people who are doing interesting things in the geospace in whatever way, shape, or form. And then we have fun. And, and, and we learn a little bit about what they're doing and um, we hear some talks and then we meet up and have some beers and we exchange information and people get to meet each other. Um, we try to summarize it kind of in our tagline, which is um, geo innovation for fun or profit. So um, it could be startups, it could be big companies, it could be people from academia, it could be um, hobbyists. So we have a lot of people kind of from the, the open street map community and, and, and those types of groups. Um, or it could just be people who are, are interested in maps or geo who come happen to come along. Uh, yeah, so as I said, we we've been, we do it about once a quarter. You know, it, it varies slightly. It's, it's not a very uh, strict or rigorous schedule. Um, depending on the city, we have anywhere between, uh, I think the biggest one we've ever has maybe 100 people. Um, but normal is, let's say, 50, 75 or so. In some of the newer cities, of course, it's still a little smaller. And uh, yeah, well, we've been doing it for about 10 years. So in that regard, it gives us a chance to kind of look back over, over where the industry is, has been and how it's been evolving and what the trends are and things like that. I think what I find really interesting about Geomob, the idea of it and the community that, that you're building around this concept, is that it's 
everyone. It's everyone that's interested in geo or interested in solving a problem that has something to do with geospatial, that has something to do with maps. And I think that this is what we're seeing out in the industry as well. We're not just seeing the classically trained geographers, the uh, geospatial specialists and the remote sensing people involved in the industry anymore. These, these are people that are just showing up and they're solving problems and they're seeing interesting ways to to do what we, what we called mashups back in the day, where they are just curating a whole bunch of data or putting together different services in a way that solves a problem in the geospatial world. Wow. I, I, I don't think I've heard the word mashup in at least five years. <laughs> That's kind of a, a weird throwback. Um, but yeah, what, what you say is absolutely correct. So so we definitely have people with the kind of hardcore GIS background and work at, um, let's say, the National Mapping Agency is in the UK, uh, the, the Oregon Survey or um, here in Barcelona, which is another city we have the, the Catalan mapping agency. Those people definitely come and contribute and often give talks. But but a big part of the audience is just uh, people who don't really self-identify necessarily as being geo developers, but much more is just they're building a service uh, or a product or whatever that happens on the geo aspect. And so they start, um, you know, they come along and tell us about that and, and learn and meet from the others and pick up some tips and tricks. Um, it really is kind of a very broad spectrum. Um, I guess I can, should tell you a little bit about kind of how we structured the event. Um, basically, we um, it's, it's in the evenings. Um, we have, depending on how many people volunteer to speak, anywhere between four and six different speakers. Each speaker uh, gets 10 to 15 minutes to, to present their topic. Um, and I really try to be selective. There, there's one qualification I try to have in terms of who gets to speak. And that is, they should be a doer. Okay, so that may maybe they're a software developer, maybe they're a product manager, um, maybe they're the founder of, of a geo startup in some way. But um, but really, I want the people who are actually building and creating the things, not kind of marketing PR people. For those talks, we have an hour, hour and a half of talks, and then afterwards we we typically go to a nearby pub, um, and and and. It, both of those sides of the event are very important. On the one hand, the talks where we learn about new things, but then the the socializing aspect where people get to mix and mingle um, and and ask ask very detailed questions of, of the speakers if they found it interesting, um, and and that's what kind of really creates the community. Um, and we found that's quite important also that we that we physically go kind of to another venue and a more social venue because then it kind of breaks down the barriers in the audience. So. You know, sometimes some of the speakers we have had some some big names um, or people from big brands, and and then the audience you might have you know a first year student or something. But because it then is in kind of more of a social interaction, it, it's uh, it's it's much easier for people to kind of comment and learn and and share ideas and um, and that's really what we're trying to do. So what we're trying to stimulate. Okay, so, so we've got this community, this very broad community of people that are interested in, in geo in some way, shape or form. And I think it's really important to, to note that they're all makers, they're all people that are actually doing things, at least the presenters. Um, so, so what kind of projects do you see them working on? What kind, do you see any trends in, in, this, in this community? Uh, a lot of trends, actually. Um, it varies slightly by city. So uh, as I said, we're in four cities now, the original one being London which uh, has, obviously has a, it's, it's a huge city and has a huge uh, thriving tech community. So, but, you know, there are a lot of startups uh, because they're trying to get the word out about their service. Um, it, the other cities, maybe it's a kind of more diverse mix. We often have the event at different universities. So we get people from, from academia. Um, uh, but, but really it's as broad a mix as possible. Anyone who wants to volunteer. Uh, in terms of trends, I guess the, uh, having done it now for 10 years, there are a lot of things that we see. Um, so, so one big trend, the mega trend is um, that the barriers to entry to doing amazing things have fallen significantly. And, and actually when we started uh, Geomob in London, it, it, a big component was all the people, you know, that's where uh, OpenStreetMap started 15 years ago. And, there, and we saw a lot of people come from that kind of original OpenStreetMap group. And you know one of their main motivations of creating OpenStreetMap was just getting access to data. It was cost prohibitive for people to get good geodata to to do things, and so and now that's not the case at all. I mean, it, now the, the the problem is the other way around. There's too much data, so there's more and more um, value in kind of curation rather than creation of data. 
I guess I, obviously another big trend is of course the rise of mobile. Everyone now has a device all the time with them that knows where they are. And so that opens up all kinds of possibilities. Um, uh, I guess, um, yeah, the trend that you kind of alluded to at the beginning that um, we have more and more people who who don't come from a GIS background in any way. They don't have any kind of formal geo training. Uh, they don't self-identify as being GIS people or geo people that is, they're just kind of software developers or, or in many cases, they're just like, Oh, I have this, I have an idea or a vision for a project or a product. And, you know, it turns out I need geo to do that. Um, and, and yeah, because of mobile now more and more, uh, products and projects have it, a geo aspect. Interesting, more and more niche tools coming about. So whereas people previously might have taken a broader approach and say, I'm going to build this big, amazing thing that's going to change the world. Um, you know, we still we still have those kinds of people, but but now you also see more and more people who just take a much more pragmatic approach and say, Oh, I built I built this little service that does X and it it, it still solves this niche need. Um you know, people have this problem, I'm gonna charge this amount of money to help them solve this problem. So we see businesses like that. But really it's a broad spectrum. I mean we've had we've had uh startups all the way through to artists. Um, you know, many of the projects that come in, not many, but but some of the projects, and you know, there's no business model behind it at all. It's just someone says, Here's a cool idea I had and and the technology now makes it possible. Um so here's what I want to do. We we've had people and uh, we've been fortunate to have people from you know, actual people who draw maps, like physically by hand still draw maps. And come in and they just talk about you know how they do that and they, the, the challenges of, of doing that in especially in an increasingly digital world um so really it's the broadest possible spectrum of anyone doing anything interesting in geo i'm really glad you mentioned that that the, there's room for for non-programmers as well for for non-technical people and that you have artists showing up and saying hey I'm I'm physically drawing a map. This is not scalable. It's probably not repeatable. This is a one of a kind thing, and you don't need to be don't need to be technical to to do this, or perhaps even to appreciate it. So that, that's really cool that that side of it is also being represented. Now, when when you look at this broad spectrum of people and and projects and ideas, and you, you've already sort of identified a few of the trends you see at GeoMob itself. Do you see those trends being reflected in the broader geospatial industry? I, I think so in that, um, you know, the, the tooling around geo, whether it's a service like, like Google Maps or whether it's the availability of data or something like OpenStreetMap, um, you know, it's just gotten so much easier to build things, uh, to build, and I don't mean just like, you know, kind of quick little prototypes. I mean, actually robust, scalable, usable, uh, impressive tools and services. All of the the software, you know, I'm thinking of projects here like um, Leaflet or um, open layers that make it so much easier to do things with maps on websites and in apps. Um, uh, the ability to get the user's location from, from a mobile application, um, you know, all of that has just made things so much simpler. Um, but then that opens an interesting challenge, right? That in that Previously, the challenge was, how do I get the data? Now, then you can get the data. Then you say, well, how do I, how, how do I build it? Okay, so now, now it's simpler and simpler to build it. And now increasingly the challenge becomes, how do I, just because I build it, how do I get people to use it? And how do I um, make people, make the world aware of my, my amazing new thing? Um, and that, that, that challenge uh, remains difficult. Um, so, uh, but that, that's what keeps exciting. I mean, we, we still, uh, I, I, I should say, you know, not all of those problems, it has gotten simpler, but that doesn't mean everything is simple. We had a talk a couple of weeks ago from a, a guy from a, a gaming background, and he had, has his company that just built a, a a virtual reality exact replica of all of Manhattan. You know, getting all the building um, shapes and profiles from OpenStreetMap and things like that. And, you know, a real technical challenge to do this to the massive amount of data, and they're trying to render it super quickly so that it, and, and I mean, he showed us examples where it's like you're literally walking around Manhattan as you look through these kind of virtual reality uh, goggles. Very cool, very cool. I mean, so there are definitely still people pushing the uh, the technical forefront of what's possible. Um, but likewise, now you also see more and more people where the challenge is how do I how do I motivate people to to use the service? How do I get people to share the service? How do I tap into a, um, emotional desires and 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 uh, and get people to 
to really become passionate about a service. I think you're touching on a really interesting point there, because I, I think in a world where everyone can, then everyone will. And we, we see this all the time in, in social media. And then if everybody is doing it, this makes for a very noisy world. Absolutely correct. Um, so, so, yeah. so, so then the next question is, how do I reach those people? How do I reach my people? How do I find them? How do I tell them what I've built? How do you see people solving that problem? Um well, I mean, there, there's no single solution, right? It's a combination of many things. But I will say this: I said there's there's always space for creativity, and and people are are coming up with clever new things all the time. Um, we yeah, we had a talk actually uh, two weeks ago in London at our last London event, um, and uh, the guy who who at the end he was kind of voted best speaker. We kind of do an informal you know, by show of hands, so the best speaker. And he, a guy named James, he had built a, an interesting service called The Street Near You, which um, which was, he had taken a data set. He came from the background of working in uh, museums and they found a data set of the addresses and photos of people who had died in World War I. So kind of millions of people in the UK who had, millions of soldiers who had died. And he took that data set and he, all he did was, um, it, you know, it was on index cards, physical index cards. And they digitized it and geocoded all the addresses and then created literally a mashup, as you say, like like showing that on a Google map. Um, and so there was nothing really technically that complex or interesting about this service, but it it really succeeded in tapping into an emotional um, current. It, you know, it, it had the, he did this right around kind of the 100th anniversary at the end of, of World War I. And, and he was very adept at using social media um, to get it out there. Um, and and, and w one thing it, it really reminded me of is people are still, it, even though we live in a, in a globalized society and, you know, when uh, something happens on the other side of the world, you hear about it instantly, it, but people are still very interested in what's happening near them. And, and that's something that where location-based services have a key role to play. So with his mashup, you could literally type in your address in the UK and see, okay, on my street, how many soldiers were there that died in World War One, and you could see pictures of them, and so very emotional, you know. And 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 we've actually had many talks over the years of, of these kind of historic things where you can visualize and go back. Um, and we have a talk coming up in in Barcelona in January. I'm really looking forward to this guy's talk, where uh, they kind of took old photos of Barcelona of the old city from from the 1890s and things, and. I'm not sure exactly how they did this, but through different rendering techniques, they kind of created a Google Street View of the old city of Barcelona using these photos. And it's kind of like, it gives you the effect that you can kind of walk through the city. Really cool, really, really cool. Um, so that's what I mean where there's still a lot of room for creativity. And the people who are doing well are the people who are understanding what data is now available, how to curate that, how to simplify it, and how to apply it to the the new technologies in a way that makes it easily digestible for for the relevant audience. Um, and then, how do you motivate that relevant audience to share it with their peers? Um, so that was with this a street near you. That was one thing. That was why it exploded because he, you know, people would kind of check out their own street or check out their parents' house or whatever, and then they would you know immediately mail it to someone or post it in social media, and it just really exploded and really captured the public imagination. I think you made some really interesting observations there. And of course, you, you mentioned Tobler's first law of geography, you know, things that all, all things are related, but near things are more related than distant things. And, and that would definitely tie in nicely with, with that observation that people are really interested in what's happening around them, what's local to them, what happened on my street. And, and also that observation that if you build it, they won't come. You need to do something else. And, and tapping into that emotional side of it through through geospatial through through space through that relevance because this thing happened near me i wonder if we're going to see more services like that in the future as opposed to scaling up you know we're all talking about scale how can we do this at a global scale perhaps we're going to shrink down again and say well how can we do this at a very local scale and provide something that's really relevant to the users well i, I think that very well could be this case because um you know, there's, a, there's an adage in product managing. If, if you're making something for everyone, you're making it for no one, right? It, you, it's much better to have the thousand people who love your product than to have the hundred thousand people who are kind of, eh, okay, it's nice. 
you know, kind of ambivalent about it. Um, and so maybe obviously local geography is a way to do that, you know, um, and over the years we've had, we've had several, um, trying to think of some other services along that line. You know, we had at the rate right when they first launched, we had city mapper, which is a, a successful startup, a you know, well-known brand now, now in many cities, but it was originally designed as a tool to, as anyone who's ever lived in London knows, one of the great weaknesses of the city is that it's a huge pain in the ass to get around. Um, and so City Mapper, their original premise was just, we help you get around London. And we, we combine all the different transport services. And I mean, it sounds like a trivial thing of like, how do I get from A to B? But because they really adapted it to the, the nuances of London, it exploded, it exploded. And, um, and so there's definitely room for those kind of very niche, niche products. That's, I would say, yeah. Through, through your involvement with with, um, with these startups that you've invested in, the startups that you've created yourself and GeoMob, and you've been in the industry for a, for a, for a while now, um, when you look around, what kind of big opportunities do you see out there at the moment? Oh, well, um, I, uh, this this idea of building niche services, in, in, I don't mean niche, and um, as we just before, like concentrating on one city, but like targeting one very very specific piece of the value chain. And executing on that very well, um, that's a little bit what, what we're trying to do with OpenCage, you know, with our geocoding service. We don't we don't do maps, we don't do routing, we don't do any of that. We do geocoding, and that's it. Um, and so there are more and more companies like that who have who find their little niche and become the absolute experts on that. I, I think that's uh, there's always going to be an opportunity for that. Um, I don't think what other um, kind of services we kind of see. Uh, I don't know. I mean, as I said, there, there's always room for creativity. There's always room for people who just, you know, the, the, the old adage is true, find a problem and then solve it. And so and a, another one, one of the most memorable talks, and in some ways, one of the most meaningful talks we've had at GMO over the last couple of years, in the UK, there's a service. And this was one guy's idea. And again, his background was as a designer, not as a, a software developer, as a, um, a, you know, a GIS person. It's a, it's a company or a service called Proxy Address. So in the, in the UK, a big challenge that people have if you is that everything, everywhere you go, every official uh, interaction you have, like let's say you want to open a bank account or whatever, first thing they ask is, you know, can you provide your address and proof of address? Okay. So um, the problem is if you're homeless and you don't have an address. So then that means you know, you can't get a bank account because you don't have a bank account. You can't, you know, get an apartment because you can't, you know, you can't get a job because you know, so you, you kind of fall out of a lot of services because you don't have this address. Um, and, and it becomes unnecessarily difficult to, to, for you to try to get your, get, get back into society. And so what he did is said, look, we actually have, why don't we create kind of fake addresses for people, a, a so-called proxy address where it will look just like a real address. The postal service will treat it as a real address, but it will know, however, to route that mail to kind of to the local council or whatever. Um, and and in this way, these people will be able to get you know get their get their foot back on the ladder and 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 not fall out of the system, um, which which obviously then becomes you know once you're out of the system, it's usually difficult to get back into it, and and much more expensive. Um, and so really amazing of how this guy took the simple idea of. Um, you know, how can we find unused addresses? So as an example, one, one, yeah, in many, many cities, people, you know, there's a superstition against the number 13. So many streets won't have a, a house 13. So what if we just, you know, in streets that don't have a house 13, we could create a house 13, a, 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 a database entry for the house 13 and someone can, a homeless person can use that as their address. And so really clever kind of a, a way of, seeing a problem and thinking of like, okay, how do we solve this with the tools that we have currently, you know? And um, the the thing I really liked about this is it wasn't, you know, th this guy was really approaching the problem from the, the, the design of the whole problem. If you had just approached this with like a, a committee and a team of product managers, you might say, okay, well, let's go to the bank and we can assign this guy some kind of code and we can get the banks to recognize that code and, and you know, it, it's like it's going to require so much change and it's going to be so hard to implement. And so instead, what he said is like, you know, the, the existing systems out there all expect an address. 
So how do we give this guy something that is like an address? And that way he can stay in the existing system rather than trying to reinvent everything. Really eye-opening, really cool. Yeah, and it, it, it's almost a little bit scary that we have to sort of spoof a, a location so so this person can get back into the system. So we need a physical address that it's actually tied to a location. You have to have a house or an, you know, a physical address I can send this thing to. Otherwise, you're, you're not welcome in our system. I think that's really eye-opening and interesting in itself, especially in such a, such a digital world. And for me, it really highlights the fact that those interfaces between the physical and the digital, we, we've got a long way to go to, to build all the bridges across there that we actually need. Absolutely correct. I mean, this is the, the reason that stuck out as one of the, my favorite talks over the years wasn't, um, I mean, obviously it's a great cause and it's helping people, but exactly what you say is like, it really causes you to reflect on like, are we doing this all wrong? Like, like, why are we forcing people to have a physical, ad? you know, it, it really causes you to question some of the fundamental assumptions of, of your thinking about geography. Um, and, and those are kind of the best talks. And actually, actually, that's one of the points, um, you know, having done this now for 10 years, it's often very surprising. Uh, so people volunteer for the talk and you know, they give me kind of like the title of the talk. And, and oftentimes I, you know, I don't know the people well or whatever. And I just say, okay, great. You know, you're on it this day. Um, and, and ahead of time, it's almost impossible to predict which talks are going to be uh, the most thought provoking because some people come with seemingly very boring and dry or uh, topics, but they give, they really change your thinking and, and they do such a good job presenting and how they bring out the examples. And then on the flip side, we, we I hate to say it, but when we first started um, in London, you know, we I, London has many of the big tech companies. I'm thinking here of like the Googles of the world um, and, and uh, Bing and stuff like that. They're, they're, they all have offices there. And so people are like, oh, well, let's get, let's get someone from these big companies. And they were super boring because usually they they weren't the doer it was kind of the person kind of reading the press release of what had gotten invented in california or whatever and that was kind of when we switched our model to saying that these companies are super innovative but unless it's the doer actually coming and talking about it we, we don't just want to have someone read a, a press release but, but like that's not interesting for anyone so um so yeah you never know you never know where the interesting topics are going to come from um, and you never know uh, who's going to do a good job presenting. And, and that's kind of why we have our format of we have five or six talks. And, you know, frankly, of the five or six talks every time, there, there are some that are amazing and there are some that are, some that are frankly, less amazing. But uh, it's the mix. I, I, I wonder if the, the reason why GeoMob is growing the way it has, and, and it seems to have, have grown in the last um, five, six months anyway, so you expanded to a few more cities and things seem to be happening on a more regular basis. I wonder if people aren't re recognizing that problem. Okay, if I build it, they won't come. I need to tell someone. I need to be a little bit of a marketer. I need to be a little bit of a speaker. And, you know, if my project is going to win, I need to be able to spread the word somehow. So I wonder if this, if something like GeoMob is going to be, uh, critical in solving some of those problems for, for for these creators out there in the world, and I wonder if we're going to see more of this kind of thing. Uh, I I think so in some ways. I think there's also a lot of value in having a community around you. And um, you know, more and more, uh, one of the trends, especially among startups, is kind of the remote work trend, and um, and it's great for many many reasons. I mean, speaking for myself as someone who's a parent, I have two kids, and it's much easier to structure my life if I can I can work remotely or work from home. Um, but you definitely do miss the, you know, that, that sense of community. Um, and, and, and so GeoMob helps kind of provide that, you know, we have, um, it, in all the cities we have, like, uh, everyone's welcome. And every time we get some new people who come, but we all usually have like a group of regulars who are there as well, who've been coming for a while. And, um, and so you, you do build up that sense of community. Um, and in some cases, it's interesting because some of the people as in London where we've been for a long time, you know, people move through the industry at different stages in their career. You know, sometimes you might be uh, a student, sometimes you might be the, an employee, sometimes then you maybe start your own thing, maybe then they, you're working at a big company. And, and people move through all different roles within the community. Um, so it, it's interesting then to, to, to have that mix of perspectives. Um, but I definitely think there's a value in in the, the physical face-to-face -face meeting, the, the social aspect of it. Yeah, I, I think that when I hear you talk about it, 
and describe the community, I can't help but draw a parallel to, to what's happening in the digital space. You know, so we, we see the big trends, the, this idea of curation over creation of data. So the relationships between and among data, between and among services in the online world. And it sounds to me like what you're talking about is these same sort of relationships, but just in the physical world and between people. And, and that's the thing that's helping to drive the innovation that we see in the geospatial world at the moment. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, the, the 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 pace is definitely picking up, and and the the new ideas come from those interactions, right? Where you know, person A does something, and then person B sees it and puts a new spin on it, or you know, takes it a step further, or combines it with a different data set, and you know, the next guy does does something on top of that, and um, and of course that can happen in digital communities, but I think uh, one way to accelerate it is is also the face to face interaction. Um, and so that's one of the one of the goals of what we're kind of aiming for with GeoMob. Okay, so I'm a listener of this podcast, and I'm sitting out there and thinking, "This is great. I'm all in." How do I get involved in in GeoMob? What would I do if I wanted to start my own chapter, if you will, in the city that that I live in? Right. Well, well, first of all, of course, if you're in one of the cities that we're active in, and and that's London, Barcelona, Munich, and uh, Lisbon, um, you should come along to our events. Um, Second of all, we you should check out our website and get on the mailing list. We have a, a, a newsletter that we send out once a month where we kind of send updates of the events and also summaries uh, after the events. Um, it's very it, it's only one email a month, so don't worry, we're not going to spam you or anything like that. Um, but yes, we're, we're we're definitely on the hunt for uh, other people, other volunteers who want to start GeoMob in their city. Um, over on the website, we'll set up a page where you can kind of um, see some of the steps. Also, I don't have any, uh, it's not, I know it's worked in the cities that I've been in, but there, there's no kind of rule that GeoMob needs to be the same in every city and, in, um, you know, some, there are no hard and fast rules. And maybe in, in some cities like London, it makes sense to have an event every two months because there's so much going on and so many people, uh, you know, maybe from a smaller city, maybe once or twice a year makes, makes more sense. This is not a slick, polished uh, marketing event. That, that, that's not what GeoMob is about. GeoMob is just about, you know, everyone gathers up, a few people talk about what they're working on, and then we hang out. Um, so as long as you're trying to keep to that type of ethos, please do get in touch. Um, there's contact forms on the website, and, um, you know, we'll definitely look at how we can how we can get it going in your city. Ed, I want to thank you so much for, for taking the time to tell us a little bit about what's happening in GeoMob, the, the trends you see in the industry, and letting us know how we can get involved with GeoMob if we're interested in that. So thanks so much for coming along today. Much appreciated. Uh, it was my pleasure to be back, and uh, congratulations to you on your uh, on the success of the podcast over the last, last couple of months. Uh, you know, it, it's, in, in many ways, it's very similar to what you're doing by exposing different voices from the community. It's very similar to kind of what we're the, the GeoMob ethos. So um, it's great. Cheers, Ed. Thanks. Bye. Right at the start of the interview, I mentioned our sponsor, Hive Mapper. That's Hive as in Beehive Mapper. And I mentioned that you can just take video footage, and it could be from a drone, it could be from another aerial platform. I've even seen this being, being done from people with cell phones and cars, where they upload data to the platform, and they have it automatically converted into 3D geospatial layers. So I think that's really cool in itself that video footage can be converted and used in this way. But I guess that's only half the story because that makes some really nice images, really nice pictures. But I didn't mention that you can do a whole bunch of analysis on the platform as well. And one of the features that I think is particularly cool is the height above ground feature. So this is just a sliding bar where I can move it from zero to whatever your maximum height is and you can see the colors change throughout the image showing you the highest points. So if you're used to working with, with GIS, you'll know that, uh, how to do this and you'll understand the power of this. But I think the truly fascinating thing about this feature and, and this platform in general is that you only upload video footage. You don't have to have a height model in the background. You don't have to have LiDAR data. This is either there for you or it's derived from the data that you upload. And there is a whole bunch of use cases for this. And that's it for another episode of the Mapscaping Podcast. My name is Daniel, and I really want to thank all the people that have taken the time to rate and review the show on iTunes. It really means the world to me. And if you have a friend and you think they might enjoy this, please share it with them. I would really appreciate it. As always, you are more than welcome to reach out to me for whatever reason on, sh on social media. And to do that, you'll find a few useful links in the show notes. That's it from me. We'll talk again next week. Bye.